uh, wherever you are, um, you are welcome to this um, uh, this event. We we are delighted and happy to uh, bring together a, a group of panelists and participants to to begin to discuss and share experiences about neocolonization in global surgery and, and how we can begin to create actionable uh, steps that uh, can address uh, these issues. And we, we have a very uh, interesting and diverse um, uh, group of panelists uh, today. Uh, I will introduce them very briefly. Um, we have um, Professor Roy, uh, who is a, a general and trauma surgeon from Mumbai and uh, is an expert in uh, public health. Uh, we have Desmond, Desmond Jumba, who is um, originally from Cameroon, is a health policy expert and presently works with uh, Operation Smile uh, in Ghana. We have uh, Dr. Justina Sheyo Lajide, who is um, a pediatric surgeon from uh, Lagos in Nigeria. And we, we also have um, Dr. Omolara Williams, uh, who is a pediatric surgeon also from Nigeria. And we have one seller from, uh, is a plastic surgeon from uh, Mexico. Uh, so that's our panelist. We have uh, Kitty Jenkin, uh, who is the communication director at Lifebox and will be guiding us through uh, most of our discussion. But before we get started, uh, Kitty, we quickly, um, I will quickly, I will ask each panelist to just say a word to our participants, uh, starting with Roy. Hi, uh, thank you, Emmanuel. It's it's great to be here on this on this topic, and I'm signing in from Mumbai, and I hope to give the South Asian and the Indian perspective to this topic. Thank you. Thank you, Desmond. Uh, thank you, Emmanuel. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm excited to be part of this very important discussion. And just for a little bit of context, I like like Emmanuel said, I grew up in Cameroon. I studied in the United States, and I got my master's in global health in the United States as well. Um, and I now live and work in Ghana with Operation Smile, and very delighted to be here. Thank you, Tina. Um, hi, Emmanuel, thank you. Thank you, everybody. I'm happy to be here. I just hope by the end of today, we'll have very good actionable goals that will change the terrain of global surgery. Thank you. Thank you, Lara. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, I hope we'll all have um, a nice discussion today. And thank you for making time to join us for this session. Thank you, Guan. Yes, hi, um, I'm also very glad to be part of this. I'm a plastic surgeon. I live and work in Mexico. I'm based in Mexico City and work in the south uh, part of Mexico uh, with uh, indigenous children uh, doing uh, basically cleft lip and palate surgery and, and other craniofacial uh, abnormalities. And I've been working with uh, Smile Train Foundation, and we also have our own organization here and been working on this for over a decade now. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, so to get started, um, uh, so much has, is happening um, in the global surgery world, uh, especially in the last uh, few years. Uh, and every every individual and organizations involved in global surgery and global health are doing their best to uh, help um, many times with a lot of limitations. And I want to come to Roy, to start with Roy. I know Roy, you have been in the peak of the global surgery uh, happenings. 
And I just want you to share with us your thoughts about some of the power imbalances from the global north to the global south that plays out on the global surgery field. Thank you, Emmanuel. It's, it's been an interesting journey. Um, it's been two decades of uh, global surgery work. It wasn't called global surgery. It's been through many names. It's been called mission surgery, tropical surgery, international surgery. And I, I think what happened in 2015 was trying to bring it all together in a more a global fashion with sign-ins from the ministries of health and, and to make it a science rather than just a, a, a thing that people engaged in on vacation. So it has, it has moved on from there. And I would say when I see a very, take a very broad outlook, I think the power imbalance actually is decreasing. Now I know I'm saying something which is uh, not commonly said, but earlier on, I think I would not be able to speak up at all. You would never have a forum like this where you could speak. And now the very fact, Emmanuel, that you have, you've started this kind of a conversation itself puts me on a very powerful position to be able to speak up. So firstly, thanks for that. Now, I would think earlier on that, um, you know, when I started uh, this whole global surgery business about 17, 18 years ago, and there would be uh, a person coming from, the, uh, from a high income country or from the West, as we used to call it then, or a developed country, as we used to call it then, it would be a white man. And then I thought it was all nicely color coded. I knew that if it was color coded, I knew the white man would have uh, more power and the brown man would have less power. It was very easy to understand. Okay. So once we did that, he would come in and within minutes of picking him up at the airport, he would say, he would, we'd go hit the Mumbai traffic, which moves at zero miles per hour. And there are thousands and thousands of vehicles. And he would say, Roy, what you really need for your trauma problem are choppers, are choppers, my friend. And this was like 75 seconds into the conversation. And I had been 17 years in the field, but he had an answer to it. And I would say, oh, voila. Then comes another white man and says, uh, works with me for six months. And after that, I ask him, so what do you think about trauma in India? And he says, uh, uh, Roy, I haven't been here long enough. I don't think I can comment. So that's when I figured that, you know, this very easy classification of high income country, low income country, white people coming in, brown people receiving ends. I think it's a little more complicated than that. And power equations is not all about high income countries and low income countries. And I can say that for sure, that even within the low income countries, there is a lot of elitism. There's a lot of classes. There's a lot of, I mean, India is known for its casteism. So I think we'll have to be a little more nuanced in our argument when we say that it's high income country and low income countries and the power imbalances are just north south. It's, it's oversimplifying the problem. I think the problem is a lot to do with the power balances and the golden rule is he who has the gold makes the rules. So finally, if it, it doesn't matter if he was white or if he was brown or if he was black, it didn't matter. So I know I'm, I'm placing it very controversially, but I think we need to go beyond this color-coded argument of high income and low income. Over to you, Emmanuel. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Roy, for um, capturing everything in your very characteristic uh, uh, way. I want to ask the other panelists uh, what their thoughts are uh, on, on as regards power imbalances. So maybe, maybe I'll go to uh, Desmond. Um, you interacted across the entire from north to south. What are your thoughts regarding power imbalances? Um, I, I think that we're making some uh, progress. And as Roy has said, just the, the mere fact that we are having this discussion is, is uh, some progress. 
Um, I, I'm not sure that I would say it's, it's, it's a lot of progress, but it's, it's a progress in the right direction because um, in order to um, actually effect change, there's some action that is required. Um, but this discussion I think is important because firstly, we have to, we have to be able to, to, to agree that this is a problem in the first place. And I'm not sure that everybody um, agrees that you know the uh, their power imbalances or that there's there's uh, colonialism and neocolonialism that still exists in global surgery and, and, and global health. Um, and so I think there's there's still a huge need to have this uh, discussion um, because what what I've realized is that I mean there, there are pretty much two types of reactions to this discussion that we're having. There are those who um, just say that, you know, we're making too much out of nothing, right? You know, surely everybody in global health means well, you know, and everybody is compassionate and wants to change things. And why are you preventing us from doing, you know, the good work that we want to do to help you guys? Um, and so there's, there's that denial that happened. And then there, there are those, the second group is from those who I mean, rightfully so, or may, maybe because of, of uh, you know, peer pressure or PC culture, they, they just agree that sure, it's, it's an issue, um, but they don't really understand the issue. Um, and so they, they carry on to develop um, policies and make statements that don't really address the issue because they don't really understand it. Um, so I would say that there's, there's, we're very much at the beginning stages of, of this discussion. Um, but, but it's, it's good progress that has to be had. And we have to agree that there's a problem before we come up with um, substantial solutions that will actually address the core problems. Uh, right, thank you very much, Desmond. Uh, Lara, I want to come to you um, as someone who you, you've had some formal training uh, in global surgery. Now, this is some, tr the training that many individuals in low and middle income countries desire to have, but they simply cannot afford it or they have no access to it. Uh, in, from your experience and in your uh, opinion, what do you think are some of the barriers that, that are working against LMIC uh, colleagues to acquire training in global surgery? Thank you very much, Manuel. Um, you you hit the primary thing, um, you hit the nail on the head saying that they cannot afford it. Um, many of the training opportunities that there are are in high income countries and they are interestingly structured for high income country candidates, really. The setup is such that um, the high income country candidates are set up to go to low income countries to help and provide, um, you know, mission surgeries and the works. So it's really not structured ab initio to accommodate low income country candidates. So considering the fact that many, well, low income countries are low income. So without funding or without consideration in structuring the training fees, et cetera, for low income country candidates, they really can't get into it. So, in that way, it really doesn't even come into um, anyone's view to most people's view to jump, to get that kind of training. Um, talking about the structure of the training itself, that's another fundamental problem. The fact that the training is not structured for low income country people to, to help themselves. Really, if you're gonna teach somebody to fish you need to, if you're gonna give it, it's better to teach somebody to fish than to just give them fish. So, and when you're gonna teach them to fish, you should consider the, the terrain, you should consider the way their own rivers are, you should consider how to address those things. But um, just as Desmond said earlier, the, there's no context in men in, in um, administering the training. Many times you don't get the, the perspective of the low income country people in terms of the training. And so they are not really, it's, it's, it, you feel unwelcome in the, in the training setting. And so um, 
that constitutes a barrier, absolutely. The other thing that you also find is that um, when the training opportunities are put out there, the criteria, it goes down to the structure again, the criteria that is put there is such that um, it has the notion, the noble notion that the LMIC person needs to go back to prevent brain drain. But then in order to achieve that, the person has to have a certain level of employment or has a set and then has to have sponsorship from the local, um, has to have a local sponsor, which we don't have. And so that constitutes a limit. The person really can't, can't come in, in, that, in that wise. But then this is all from a, um, high income countries. If we look inwards, actually, in, in addressing any problem, we will, we always also need to look inwards. We find that many desire it, but then we do not have um, enough awareness about the, in, in the global surgery perspective. We understand our local problems, but the issue of um, poverty, the issue of eco an economic downturn, work, the workforce is overworked, they are, they are short, we're short staffed and the, the challenges there limit people's appreciation of the global perspective of the problem. Because the local problem in itself is more than enough for you to chew on, to address the immediate patient that you have to, um, that you have to uh, attend to. You know? so, so that is there. And then there is, we, we have not, and we're going to have to do, do this. We have not created, there's no clear career path. I mean, when it comes to global health in terms of the medical path, particularly pediatrics, immunizations and all of that, there's so much, and ONG, there's a lot going on in public health in that area. But when it comes to surgery, surgery is still um, the neglected child, still, um, it's still very much here. It's, it's changing, but it's still the neglected child, even locally where the problem is, where there's, um, um, Barrier, access, barrier to access and all of that. So people have not seen the prospects to pursue it harder, harder as well. That is um, another um, area, another issue that is causing um, a barrier to accessing the training. All right, thank you very much, Lara. I, I like that aspect of fishing. I know my very good friend Roy used to say that uh, you don't only teach somebody how to fish, you should go fishing with him or her. That's the only way uh, you can really build capacity. Uh, so uh, Desmond, I'm tempted to come back to you again because you are one of those who have had a formal, some formal training uh, in, in global surgery. Given some of the barriers to training that Lara has mentioned, how do you think this is impacting uh, on global surgery generally? Mm. Um, I mean, I'll give, I'll give an example based on my experience. I mean, I think it's important for the audience to know that I'm not, I'm not a clinician, I'm not a surgeon. Um, I do have a master's of global health um, from a university in the United States. Um, and, and I also did study in the United States. So I did my, my bachelor's there. Um, and after I got my bachelor's, I applied to a master's in global health program because, because I was interested in global health and um, very much interested in going back to Cameroon and working on the continent uh, to improve health systems. But there, but there was something that struck me when I applied to the master's in global health program. Uh, the first was uh, the lack of funding, which Lara um, you know, spoke very much about. You know, there, there's, there's a lot of interest in global health um, in these master's programs from around the world. So, so they're actually pro proliferating all over, all over the world, but they're especially in high income countries. Um, and I think part of that is because there's, there's interest from, from undergraduate students and from uh, medical doctors to, 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 to do these types of programs. Um, but then I, I, was, I was very fascinated by, I don't know if it was fascinated, but troubled by the lack of opportunities for those from low-income countries um, to be involved in these global health programs. So in my example, you know, when I got into, into my global health program, I, I, I knew I couldn't afford it. 
Um, but I was fortunate enough to be in the US. So I went to the school myself and I tried to make a solid case for why they should give me the funding for me to study there. Um, and, I, and, I, and, I, and, I made, and I made a case, um, but again, if you're applying from Cameroon, if you're applying from, from Nigeria or from India, you know, uh, it's, <laughs> I don't think that you will be able to go to and meet with the director of any of these programs to convince them. And I don't think your email uh, does as much justice. Um, but then, but then I, I got into the program um, and I had, uh, you know, there, there was some funding that was available to me and I was very grateful for that. But I was surprised that in my master's in global health program, there were really just two um, international students of the 23, I believe, international students. And this was, this was striking to me. And I wondered, you know, if this is a program that is truly meant to be global and is truly meant to to improve um, access to healthcare and surgical services in in uh, you know in in uh, developing countries or in, in vulnerable populations. Why aren't there more opportunities for um, for students from from poorly resourced centers? And and I and and while I was there, I tried to ask around, and I what what I was you know told, um, and, and this may be true just of this particular university, but. But what I was told was that um, you know, some of these programs are created uh, to make money for the universities. Um, and so there's limited, um, because there's interest from students who are um, high income students who are obviously willing to pay for this. But I found this terribly you know, troubling um, because it seemed a bit, a bit exploitative to me um, you know, that um, you know, the universities would set up these types of programs that are meant to bring, you know, social good um, in developing countries, um, but then not create opportunities uh, for um, those from these settings to be involved. Um, and, and especially the fact that it's, it's deliberately set up in that way to, to, to make money. Um, and so this is, this is one thing that I would say that um, a lot of, in my view, a lot of uh, masters in global health programs, I mean, we have to reevaluate who it's designed for, what the purposes are, um, and how it's structured. As it, is it creating more inequity and, and perpetuating neocolonialist um, uh, approaches? Um, you know, so, so that's, uh, that's, I'll leave it at that, um, focusing just on the global health masters programs. Right. Thank you very much, Desmond. Uh, Tina, I want to um, I want to come to you. Um, you you were uh, very deeply involved with the uh, the ENSOP creation process uh, for for Nigeria, and, and one of the discussions and uh, ongoing discussions in the global surgery world is the fact that uh, research, for some reason in some ways is done, global surgery research is being done in, uh, many times in an exploitative way um, to the detriment of, uh, the, of, LMIC, of LMICs. Uh, in your opinion, what do you think are the, the, the current barriers to, to research in global surgery for the LMICs? Thank you very much, Emmanuel. Um, I would like to start by say, going back to the same issue of funding. Okay, funding is a very key issue when it comes to research. And most researchers in LMICs, most probably just speaking of my head, up to 90% carry their researches in personal funds. Okay, most of the funding agencies, grants are all um, domiciled in high income countries and available in low middle income countries. And um, one issue that has been prohibitive to researchers in LMIC is accessing these funds. One of them, not limited to this, is the insistence on having collaborators in high income countries. Okay, so while that may not be so difficult to achieve if it's the collaborator for a particular ongoing research, sometimes the requirement is that there should be long standing relationship between the LMIC researcher and a um, high income country collaborator. For most LMIC researchers, it doesn't exist. 
Okay, and so that automatically excludes a large cohort of researchers who are trying to access these funds, even if they have a high quality idea, high quality research they want, they want to execute. Another scenario that plays out is when grants are acquired by, um, collab by partners in high income countries for work in low and middle income countries. The high income um, investigator is well compensated for his time and travels. And um, there's almost a number of times no compensation for the time of the low LMIC collaborator or the investigator who's doing the groundwork. So automatically that the work gets done and is well compensated because it feels favored having this kind of research domiciled within his domain. So that, 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 that you know, if we can look at it, the fact that even when it's to be compensated for, it's done at a much lower level than the HIC investigator. So that's also another issue that portrays some form of inequity. Okay, that's for an LMIC worker who's already undervalued, he's underpaid, and then his time compensation is not at par with a, um, a collaborator on the other end. So um, enough for funding. Now, um, I like what Lara said, you know, it was going on in my mind. You teach a man, you give a man fish, he has food for a day, teach him to fish, and then he has food for a lifetime, okay? So if, um, most of these researchers that um, collaborate, although there are exceptions anyway, there are exceptions, I must say that, what's coming to say we're developing research capacity, right? But if you look critically and evaluate it, the LMIC participants are collecting data. There is nothing incorporated into the research to develop the capacity of the LMIC participant to develop his own ideas, implement them, come out with good research results that are within the local context of where he works, just like what Roy was talking about, you know, generate solutions to his problems and then execute them. Most of the time it's just, um, all about um, collecting data for the research and then becomes part of the work, basically. So I think um, those are some of the things that have been barriers to this um, to research. Uh, thank you very much, Tina. Uh, Roy, I want to come back, uh, come to you uh, on the research, research issue because you've been uh, deeply involved with this. You've collaborated with so many different groups in both in HICs and LMICs. Uh, do you have any further thoughts regarding some of the barriers? So I, I couldn't agree with Tina more. Um, and, and that it has been a consistent problem. I think there have been very constructive measures um, uh, to fix it. And I think one of the main movements that I have seen over the last 10 years has been the IRB, the ethics board. Uh, somehow the ethics boards have been that kind of uh, cohort of people who are the thinking types, uh, unlike us surgeons, you know. So they, they do put in some thinking into it and they have been gradually maneuvering the whole equality agenda. And I'm not saying it's perfect. I, I, I'm, I don't think we should be thinking as good and bad I, I think it's all a continuum and we need to gradually push ourselves to, to uh, the right side. And I'm at, at this point, I would, I would uh, borrow uh, uh, the, the wisest professor of all, Dumbledore, who said that it's never a choice between the right and the wrong. It's usually the choice between right and the easy. And and that's the whole crux of the matter that we, we know we don't want to do anything wrong, but when you have an easier choice, even we tend to take the easier choice. So the, the, the ethics checklist has, has definitely improved uh, equalizing the power balance. The funders on their part also have, have definitely pushed it. It's not perfect as yet, but they are pushing it. When, you, when they see that you're not going to have any LMIC author on, on a topic which has been studied in LMICs, that's when they start saying that that's not on. And they say this much earlier. 
And they were saying this much later, but now they are saying it much earlier when you are receiving the money. So I think there are very constructive measures which are going on. And those are the kind of things that we need to push uh, forward in, in this whole construct of science that we are uh, currently debating. Over. Thank you very much, uh, Roy. Um, now, Desmond, uh, you, your recent uh, paper um, in the BMJ about um, how not to write about Vova Health really hit at the core of one of the issues about writing and publishing uh, in global health and global uh, surgery. And we do know that there are lots of problems and uh, challenges. So, so what do you think are the really the, the core problems in the way global health and global surgery uh, research is being published at the moment? Mm. Um, I, I think I would agree with what Roy has said. I mean, he, he, I, like the, I like what you said. It's, it's, you know, you never really a choice between right and wrong, You're right? It's a choice between right and easy. And, and that article that I, I published, How Not to Write About Global Health, is, is really about that. I mean, if I could summarize it in a phrase, right? I, I would summarize it to say, we know better and we should do better. Um, you know, so in the article I talk about um, the way we approach global health uh, research, um, you know, as, as has been said by several panelists, you know, the, a lot of the research priorities are still uh, being made by mostly those in high income countries and those who have access to the funding. Um, but we do understand that, you know, we, we need to get the buy-in from, from those on the ground, right? Um, and so what I've observed and is that sometimes, you know, we end up just doing these superficial uh, tactics to cover our bases, right? So, you know, in order to get the buy-in from the locals, we can set up a one to two day workshop Right at that workshop, there's really nothing that you're you're listening to because you already know what you want to do, what you want to, to research. You know what the priorities are. You already have the funding for the program for the for the research, um, and so uh, the the locals are not are not being con, uh, consulted and are not seen as partners in the project. And as as um, as you know, Tina said, you know the. The, there's not there's not really a true partnership that that is happening, um, and so I touch I touch on several things, including uh, you know getting ownership and getting buy-in from from the locals and making sure that it's a true partnership. But then I also talk on ensuring that um, you know you're taking the context into account, the local context. Um, I touched on the fact that there's a need um, to 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 build. Um, um, partnerships that will ensure that everybody that is contributing to the research, contributing to the final manuscript that is published, um, is in fact a collaborator, a true collaborator. And, and so they're not this uh, superficial, you know, um, uh, middle ghost authors from LMICs that we put on, on these research papers. So just so that we're not, um, you know, attacked on social media or or, or on other platforms. Um, and and I, so, so I think we, we all understand these things. I don't think my paper really highlighted anything that, that is new, but I just think we need to, to, to practice it. I think there's, there's, um, there's a bit of, of a hypocrisy that, that is very much alive in the way we do health, uh, global health, global surgery um, research. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Desmond. Uh, so, Guan, I want to come to you. Uh, now, I know the other panelists have gone through some of the problems from power imbalances through training and research. But you have uh, you've worked directly with um, HIC organizations. You have your own local organization, and you've been involved in some of um, uh, public health surgical practice for some time. Uh, so we want you to share with us your thoughts uh, regarding from all the aspects that the other panelists have um, 
uh, touched on so far. Yes, thank you, Manuel. Um, well, I, I really agree with um, what everyone has um, have said uh, so far. And like, like you said, I'm a plastic surgeon. I um, work in Mexico um, in a very, uh, in the south part of Mexico, which is probably the, the part of this continent with the highest incidence of cleft lip and palate and other craniofacial uh, anomalies. And we've been working for a number of years now with, with uh, these children. And well, I think there's uh, many things to say. I couldn't agree more with uh, what Desmond said at the beginning of the session regarding that uh, the first step is to recognize uh, like globally that this is not a problem of one country or one continent. This is a, a global um, health issue. And, and I'm talking about the um, uh, neo-colonialism with uh, medical missions and surgical missions. And even though we are, especially again, this part of Mexico, uh, very low income uh, part of the country and the continent, um, this does not necessarily mean that we lack um, human resources. This uh, being a low income country uh, does not necessarily mean that we lack expertise or knowledge or uh, ability as surgeons. Um, and it does mean we need money for to, to keep doing the, the, the work that we've been doing. But um, sometimes I think that for some high income countries in some part of the world, uh, they think that being a low income country mean we need everything, including surgeons coming to operate. Uh, there's a lot of surgeons in Mexico. There's uh, amazing surgeons uh, in Mexico. Um, and we, like I said, don't necessarily need uh, hands to operate. We might need many other things. Um, and well, uh, regarding the, what you've been saying about um, teaching uh, men to fish uh, instead of just giving fish for the day, uh, I think I've been working uh, as a partner of Smile Train Foundation uh, for a number of years as well. And uh, this is uh, basically the philosophy of Smile Train. And this is why we like so much working and partnering with them because their philosophy uh, in comparison with other uh, organizations, uh, it's uh, exactly that one to uh, teach people how to fish, uh, especially in the areas that they lack more. Uh, if there is a, a local group of surgeons or a, a local organization uh, that maybe it's just, um, it just lacks uh, research, they will go ahead and, and put hands on for a research project. Or uh, if we are um, lacking um, opportunities for training, then they will go and, and put hands on for uh, training resources. And they will really uh, focus on what uh, local groups need and, and make that um, grow for a better approach and better care for the people of that particular region. Thank you very much, Guan. Um, so, uh, Roy, I'm coming back to you uh, just very quickly. A, a lot of the discussion that has been going on is uh, a, an important aspect has been funding. Uh, and we do know that to be able to get the right funding and to influence policymakers, you need the right advocacy. But it does seem that um, LMICs, are having some difficulties with this. Why do you think this is so? And how is it impacting on global surgeries generally? 
Thank you, Emmanuel. That's a very good question. I, I have given up my clinical practice over the last three years to join the Ministry of Health in India. And what I have, uh, so I have transitioned from the operation theater to the policy table. Uh, so what I find is that policymakers don't really understand what surgery is. Surgery is not a disease. So if you said malaria, they would understand. You would say dengue, they'll understand. But if you say surgery, people don't really understand it as yet. So we still need to talk in terms of surgical burden of disease, which we surgeons are not very good at because uh, surgeons and epidemiologists don't really mix very well. There are very few surgeon epidemiologists. So we surgeons start with ourselves first. These are the skills we have. I'm a pancreatic surgeon. I'm a hepatobiliary surgeon. I'm a pediatric surgeon. That's the way we talk. Whereas, whereas the health minister and where the, where the ministry wants to know in this population, how many cataracts do I need to? What are the number of C-sections that are required for a community of uh, a million uh, women? So these are the questions we don't really have answers to. So when we pitch it, it's always we go saying that I'm a hepatobiliary surgeon and we need to liver transplants. And uh, the minister says, uh, liver transplant is important, but I don't think that's the most important thing that our country needs because we are all in these little silos. So that I think is the major shift. Being able to make ourselves understood is very important and surgeons have not been used to that. Look at our pediatricians, look at our gynecologists, obstetricians, they can make a much better pitch. Maternal health is not a disease, yet everybody understands maternal health. Child health is not a disease, but everybody understands child health. So now we have to move from this whole business of surgery, what does it mean, to explaining ourselves much better. And I think that is the learning that we need to do before we have the policymakers understand. The next thing that the policymakers have is that they have funds and they will tell you, I cannot reach this community. If you come in and reach this community for me, then I will pay you X amount of money because the government is not able to do it. Will you do it? But we say, no, I am a cleft lip surgeon. I'm going to come and do cleft lips. It doesn't matter if it's the rarest condition that is there in that area, but I'm going to do just that. So it's, it's, it's more about us and it's less about the community. It's very romantic to think about the community, think about the people, but we are not there yet. I think, I think we need to do a lot of learning to be able to push ourselves, to be able to explain these things better to the policymakers by understanding better ourselves. Why is it that a, a baby who comes out and needs a colostomy is not as important, but a cleft lip, cleft palate, it gets more priority and gets more publicity. And these are the questions that we need to ask. So the Lancet Commission came up with must do surgeries, which cannot wait for uh, 24 hours, should do surgeries that can wait for a week and can do surgeries that can wait for more than a week. And you will notice that all surgical missions is all about can do surgeries. And those are not the life-saving surgeries. So are we as a, go as a group going to rethink this? Over. Thank you very much, uh, Roy. Uh, so so um, I think we, we've uh, heard so much from the panelists. Um, we would like to hear uh, now from our participants, but. I want to kick off that session with, um, uh, I think we have Dr. Um, Poki from Kaneska in Eastern Africa is on the, uh, I think he's on the call. Uh, Dr. Poki, can you share with us a little bit of your experience from uh, Eastern Africa and on the, uh, especially from Anastasia perspective? Thank you so much, uh, Emmanuel, for the invitation and Kitty for making this possible. Uh, I want to thank the panelists for what they said. And before I share the experience from our side, East, Central and Southern Africa, I would like to reflect a little bit on what has been said. We have to be very careful with the future because that is what is living. If we shall invest in complaining, our mindset will be affected by the past. And therefore, there will be serious difficulties in addressing challenges ahead of us. 
I have heard of uh, the difficulties in financing for people that want to go and train in higher uh, income countries, the duration of training, the customization of the training with respect to the environment. I think that is good knowledge, but does not stop there. It must be accommodated in our environment in the low and the middle income countries. Now, Desmond and I have worked very closely in trying to put to, to use what I am talking about. We cannot survive in this world as an island. We have to accommodate the good that has been proved by evidence accrued from research in our practice before we see a change. Now, in the region, where I represent in this, uh, in this call, East Central and Southern Africa, is where the College of Surgeons of East Central and Southern Africa is found. I am sure our brothers and sisters from the Western part of Africa uh, have been working with uh, that group of people and the wonderful work that they've been doing for the, the many years. As a matter of fact, that college has greater membership in terms of countries than those that make up the East Central and Southern Africa Health Community uh, block, which at the moment is, is made up of about uh, nine countries. Now we've had a problem of meeting the gap that exists in the manpower for health. For the longest of time, specialists in the region used to be produced by MED programs in the universities. So I'm talking of countries such as Rwanda, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, Malawi, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and then you go down to Eswatini. Our population growth stands at about 2%, according to the figures that have been given us by the World Bank. No university program has managed to produce enough specialists to keep with the growth in population. At the moment, Sub-Saharan Africa has 0.17 per every 100,000 people anesthesiologist. What is recommended by WHO and the Lancet Commission on Global, Global Surgery that was done not too long time ago, stands at 20. That is the amount of work that has to be done. Surgeons will know better their numbers. I know of anesthesiologists because I subscribe to that, 0.17. Therefore, a need had to be addressed with pull and push factors. How do we go about bridging, bridging this gap? So we had to sit down as an EXA people looking for solutions uh, in the EXA region with the input from all over the world. We have to remember that surgical conditions defy regional blocks that the world has subscribed themselves to. People suffer the same conditions in the West as they suffer in the East, North and South. So training cannot compromise that component of quality because if the output are going to benefit our people, then we need to subscribe to the same quality. So Justina and Lara, whatever you learned must be brought home, customized to make sure that the skills that we impart to the trainees match that need. And so in the East Central and Southern Africa, anesthesiologists had to find a college in the year 2012 that will address bridging the gap. How? By providing training in facilities where they offer services. So this will prevent the brain drain that uh, Dr. Williams mentioned about of rural to urban migration because most of the universities are, 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 are exist in the urban areas. And when people stay there pursuing their masters, once they graduate, they've been so accustomed to the environment around that they have problems going back where they were before they came for, for masters. But with the collegiate model of training, people train in their place where they are working. So there is the, 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 the deficit in human resource for health is not felt at any time, except when they have to move for rotation on programs that are not found in the place where they're working or they have to go for exams, which is a very, very short period of time. Uh, thank this you very much, uh, Dr. Mpokin. I'm not cutting, cutting you short, but 
I see you, you did bring up the training colleges. So I just want to quickly, uh, I see that the Secretary General of the West African College of Surgeons, uh, Professor Philip Nshebwala is on the call. Uh, Philip, if you can, from the West African College of Surgeons perspective, if you can just share with us in a few, a few words, what's the college's perspective regarding some of the issues that we are discussing. Thank you very much, Emmanuel, for this interesting program. I've, I've enjoyed it. And indeed, a lot of issues have been raised. I will just take over from the East, Southern and Western, uh, Central African point of view. For the West African College of Surgeons, actually I'm on the program as an individual, not really as a Secretary General, but I can give my perspective. We believe that um, training and manpower development should be done in the region, should be done in the sub-region. And indeed, we can, this term global surgery being new has had various names. We can get support from them, but the issue of core clinical practice may not be our emphasis. It's system development and protocols that we need that are relevant to our sub-region that can be applied in our sub-region. So we, uh, most of our collaborations have had some for almost 18 years. We go back and forth. And we've had long-term sustained improvements in our system to make things work locally. The only thing I would say is that um, unlike in Southern Africa, when we train our people well, they still live to other parts of the world. We can't curtail that. And that one, we cannot yet address that. But we're happy to collaborate on systems development protocols and ensuring that the local quality and the local content is maintained. And uh, like the West African College of Surgeons, we cut across maybe 20 nations. And therefore we have also regional collaborations in various nations in three, con three languages, English, Franco uh, French, and Lusophone. So I think already we're collaborating, but in the global aspect, we're more interested in developing our systems to give local solutions to what we do. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Philip. Uh, there's um, a question here to the panelists uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Mohan. Uh, we've talked a lot about training, and the question is, if, if you were asked what would be three things that you would like to be included in a global surgery program to make it, uh, to address the needs of the LMIC participants. So I will start with um, uh, Lara. What, do you, what would you say would be three, three things you would want to see included in such training programs? So for, for, thank you very much for the question. So um, for a global surgery program, um, it will be important to include the LMIC perspective in the training, in the structure of the training, in um, addressing um, LMIC issues. It should um, have the LMIC context within it to um, provide contextual solutions to the problem. Um, I would also say that the training programs should be brought on early and incorporated into medical students training such that um, you catch them young and you have the, um, from the undergraduate days, they can actually, um, um, they can actually have a good grasp of what the challenges are. They can have a good grasp of where, in which direction they're supposed to go in providing solutions to, to the problems. Um, then um, what else would I ask for? Well, those two things for one, and then um, funding. Yes, I was, I was gonna say the funding, the funding aspect of things. Um, so, Talking about bringing advocacy into, into the issues, um, Roy actually um, brought that home very well, talking about the cohesion that is needed in the idea of um, the um, surgical burden that we, that we have. That um, is absolutely important. That is another issue that we need to bring in. The, Cohesion of idea, uh, the cohesion of ideas in order to generate good advocacy for um, the programs. And then we can generate the funding that is necessary and funding can be adequately channeled to that um, aspect of things. 
Thank you very much. I, I want to go back to the uh, participants. Um, I see Dr. Sarah Greenberg, you are, uh, you are on the call. Um, I hope you are hearing me. Uh, as someone who has been, uh, Sarah was one of the key people that made the Lancet Commission on Global Surgery uh, to work very well. So Sarah, as someone who has been involved in a lot of the th happenings in global surgery, uh, what are your thoughts on some of the issues we are discussing? Thanks, Emmanuel, and thanks for this fantastic presentation. I think as people have highlighted, it's really critical to make sure that the needs of the population that you're trying to serve are one, studied and then two, addressed. I think a lot of people have a lot of ideas of the best way to go about things, but they're not necessarily appropriate for that context. And also speaking from a high income country setting, I think it's also extremely critical to address the issues in your own country because from the United States perspective, there's huge gaps in care and inadequacies in provision of care within this country as well. Thank you very much, Sarah. And um, so, so the, it's open to participants. Um, if you want to ask your question live rather than writing it as a chat, uh, please do, just do raise up, uh, do raise your hand, and um, uh, we'll come to you. Uh, but why waiting for people to raise up their hands? I, I want to uh, ask some of the. Um, uh, uh, Professor William Harkness, you are, you are doing a lot of work in global surgery at the moment. Uh, I just want you to share with us some of your thoughts. Well, thank you, Emmanuel. Um, as you know, um, we as pediatric neurosurgeons set up Intersurgeon, which is uh, really the idea is to work a, a, in a bottom-up approach, really, rather than a top-down approach, which many of the bigger organizations and multinational uh, NGOs uh, do. And our idea really is to get people in uh, who have uh, greater resources to help and share those with those with lesser resources. And I think that, that uh, uh, we started out obviously thinking about clinical care, um, but actually we're much more interested in the whole idea of developing research projects um, and in teaching and training. And one of the interesting discussions, as you know, that we've had is the whole concept of uh, a more global surgery curriculum uh, across uh, both high and low income settings. Uh, but in addition, then drilling down into surgical specialties, uh, because I think that uh, one of the things that the pandemic has taught us um, is that uh, there is a greater reliance on digital resources. Uh, and I think much of surgical curricula, despite the fact that we adopt this old fashioned approach that everything has to be learnt hands on, but a lot of it can be done digitally and electronically. And we've been working with Help Lightning, which is a, a means of merging video streams so that people uh, can be very remote from each other, but can still carry out su uh, surgical mentorship and help in the operating room as well in the, in the clinic. So I think looking to the future, I think that um, the use of digital resources is going to be very important. Thank you very and, much, uh, William. Yeah, sorry. Needless to say, I'd encourage everybody to look at our website and if you'll allow me, I'll put that on the chat so that people know uh, what we do and where we are. Right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, William. Um, now, so from all the discussions, we, we've identified uh, a, some important challenges and barriers. But, but I think, as we always say in the world of global surgery, it, it's not enough uh, to just simply identify problems and challenges without creating uh, possible solutions. So I want to come back to the panelists. How do we both as high income countries and LMICs, how do we begin to deliberately um, address some of the barriers and problems in a coordinated 
way as we go forward. Um, so I want to start with uh, Guan. What are your thoughts in terms of uh, possible solutions to address some of the issues questions. we have um, uh, identified? Sure, thank you. Uh, well, I we've been through these uh, different uh, um, panels and, and, and uh, tables during international meetings and and we keep saying um, kind of what we've been um, talking about here regarding uh, um, being uh, aware like for the the international organizations uh, being aware of the of the local problems um, there's there's uh, one a very uh, popular saying that I like that uh, says um, one size fits all and I think for surgery and for global uh, missions and for global surgery missions this uh, does not apply uh, meaning that what one low income country uh, may need uh, could be very different from what a different low income country might need as well uh, we, for example, in Mexico, um, we do have uh, surgeons, we do have the patients, we do have the anesthesiologist, we do not have the uh, material resources, meaning sometimes we don't even have the, the, the actual sutures to, to put stitches on a, a baby with a cleft lip, for example. So um, I think for global organizations um, that um, make these efforts toward uh, providing medical care or surgical care um, to be delivered to low income countries, I think one of the key things for them is to understand what that particular country or that particular region of that country really need in order to in order to provide um, the best uh, thing that they are really lacking, uh, because not all of us lack the same exact thing. Thank you very much, Guan. Uh, Tina, your thoughts about some of the solutions that we can implement? Thank you very much, Emmanuel, um, and thank you to everyone for the discussion today. Um, I think um, one of the things I would like to say is that for, with regards to research um, funding and training like that, that I talked about earlier on, um, without lowering standards for grant applications, um, some of the restrict, restrictions I mentioned earlier could be looked into and lifted to allow researchers who have great ideas from LMICs access this funding. And then secondly, one of the, there are lots of journals out there that are global surgery journals, but the um, processing charges are so high that the global surgery researchers cannot even publish in them. So if that can also be looked into, that will also allow some researches that are taking place um, in low and middle income countries to gain greater audience worldwide. Um, another thing that I think needs to be um, ingrained in collaborations between LMICs and HICs is, a, is more like um, a platform where for any collaboration, there should be within it training in research grantsmanship so that the local collaborators can develop, actually develop their research capacity, develop their own ideas and implement researches that are um, locally contextualized for their settings. And then lastly, I'll also like to say that in terms of training, one thing that we could that could we could do in LMIC is to have our own training programs, which can be supported by high-income countries. I know some programs have already developed that in Africa. Okay, from high-income countries, have set up some um, campuses in LMICs. I think there should be more of that, so that LMIC trainees who want to access that can access it. And like Lara said, have this brought on early on in the training. I know most institutions in LMICs have students doing something in public health in undergraduate days, but there really isn't any component of surgery in that curriculum. We can also bring that into the curriculum so that there's an exposure to all this from undergraduate days all through to the um, postgraduate level. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tina Desmond. Um, yeah. So I, I would, I would, I have a few advice. I mean, I like I said at the beginning, I think we're very much at the beginning, at the very early stages of this discussion. Um, one of my concerns is that, again, we rush to develop superficial solutions and. Um, and so I would, I would say that there's a need for, I mean, because what we're talking about are, are system, systemic issues um, that are not quite as overt. You know, we're talking about, about colonialism. Um, it's not the same colonialism that, that we talked about a hundred years ago, right? Neocolonialism is a, is a bit more subtle. And I would say it's, it's quite similar to systemic racism in, in the US where it's not really in your face. Um, so I, I, my, my, my thoughts, you know, my advice is, um, you know, while these are systemic issues, there are individuals in the system um, that perpetrate some of these things that we're talking about. So there's a need for, for um, individual introspection. Um, you know, we are, we are all involved in the global surgery movement. We're all involved in trying to address these issues. Um, and, and we're all individuals in the system. So I think, you know, each one of us needs to look at our interests, you know, what are our interests in global surgery? Are we um, in it to, um, you know, to, to, to truly help or are we in it because there's want to, uh, you know, promote our careers? Um, for the medical students, you know, there's, there's a lot of interest, but then again, is it because you want to get that global health experience to, um, improve your CV. So I think there's, there's all those introspections that need to happen. But then after that, um, there's a need then to set, set up tangible, um, um, tan tangible solutions and practical solutions. Once you've understood the problem, you cannot, you cannot solve a problem that you do not understand. So once you understand the problem, then you come up with, with solutions within your own organizations to say, this is how we are going to approach our partnerships um, with any, any LMICs. We have to make sure that, you know, we bring them on board at the very beginning so that, you know, it's not, we're not trying to bring them on when we already have the ideas and we already have the funding. And because I've seen that happen quite a bit, um, you know, where, you know, ministers of health will say, yeah, that's not really good for us. I mean, that's not gonna help us, but the funding is already available. Um, so those are the two things that I would say that it's, it's introspection um, and then practical solutions. And, and, I, and I won't really prescribe, but I think um, each individual, each organization should um, come up with those strategies themselves. I mean, the, the ones that I've been mentioned are, are, are great, but I think every, every, every individual and every, every organization is, is different in, in what, they, um, what they do in global surgery. Uh, thank you very much, Desmond, Lara. Thank you very much, Manuel. Um, I was actually going to mention a couple of things that the others have mentioned. And um, talking about that introspection, one of the things I would add is the fact that when you are creating, be it research or a training program, um, understand exactly how the, um, the LMIC will be helped and identify for, for, re for real, because one of the things I, I usually say is the fact that a, a, a honest self-appraisal is one of the most difficult things to do in this life. So you honestly look at it and see how exactly, if the purpose for this is to help people, how exactly am I gonna help them? And you need to get them on board to know exactly how to help them, to, to have them contribute their quota in, in there. Um, the, the um, Dr. Uli, the anesthetist from Exa, the Exa region was talking about telemedicine. And I think that would go a long way in helping to establish local training, local opportunity for training in global surgery and expand the surgical training as well and have um, um, telemedicine, um, via telemedicine to have HIC involvement and of course a bit of travel but very importantly to have local experts involved to give local context both at the undergraduate level and at the postgraduate level to such that the awareness is 
created and we can actually generate a very um, powerful idea. We can have a lot of, um, you know, grassroots involvement and um, um, a, a lot of um, actors coming on board to expand the, you know, the advocacy to strengthen the advocacy for training and to and for funding for our training. So um, that is that is one thing that I would say. And then, um, of course, as I said earlier, get the training on early. Get people involved in in the training early. Is part of these um, solutions that we would have. And then, of course, if we get funding. Um, at some point, you might still need to, to, to sustain the quality. You will still need to train some people and have them trained in HIC settings inevitably. Of course, it will also be very important to um, have an exchange program that not only favors the HIC trainees who have an established program and a structured program, but to have a structure where the LMIC trainees actually get what they need if there's such an exchange happening so that they can help their own local community as well. But it is very important to bring the training home so that the solutions can be generated in our context. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Lara. Before I come back to the panel, I see uh, Bistra Zeleva has a hand raised. Uh, so can we hear from you, please, Bistra? Hi, thank you so much for taking my question. I really appreciate it. Great panel and um, excellent, excellent comments. Um, I'm not a surgeon. I work for an organization for an NGO that um, deals a lot with surgery, um, work for Children's Heartlink. We um, build capacity for pediatric cardiac services in low and middle income countries. And um, I've been in this field for, um, more than 17 years now and uh, work with a lot of congenital heart surgeons and pediatric heart surgeons. And I, I have a couple of comments and one question. And um, um, first of all, I, uh, several um, of the presenters here of the panelists uh, talked about the lack of um, collaboration between surgery and epidemiology and uh, public health. And I think that's really critical um, in order to bring some, uh, some changes in surgical field in general. Um, and also to bring understanding from policymakers about the needs of um, surgical patients. Um, and a, another piece that I, you know, I've observed as a non-surgeon is that surgeons like to do, uh, you know, and uh, it's surgery specifically, there's just so many surgical missions. Um, it's really um, very positioned for sort of new colonial um, type of practices. You know, people like to go do a few cases and feel good about it and then go back home. And, um, and the building capacity piece is very, very difficult. And another piece of uh, this making it more difficult is that um, the funding mechanisms are really set up to fund more that type of work versus uh, in my experience, when we try to help build a pediatric cardiac program, it takes 10 years. I do not know a funder that wants to fund the program for 10 years. Um, and half of my life is spent really fundraising and convincing people that that's the right way to do it. And so my, this comes to my question is that at the same time, the gap is so great um, in all kinds of surgical services and especially in the field that I work in, there's uh, a number of people here from India. I mean, India has some great programs and still probably serves about less than 10% of, of the annual need for congenital heart surgery. Um, and so the gap is so great and um, at, at the same time, to teach surgical skills, you have to be present, you have to be there, you have to be with your patient, you can't teach them online. So what are some solutions or can we think creatively or do you know of creative solutions of how to address that? I, I would really appreciate that. And, um, and how do you make it a team, team approach? Because um, you absolutely need a team. It's not just one person, it's nurses, it's anesthesiologists, it's a lot of other people who take care of these patients. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Bistra, for very excellent comments and, and, and I think a very key question. So that takes me, brings me back to you, Roy. Um, can you address Bistra's question and then also share with us your, your thoughts about some of the actionable goals that we need to implement? 
Thanks. Thanks, Emmanuel. Yeah, thanks, Bistro, for that good question. I, I am, I fit into your, uh, your groove, surgeon epidemiologist. Uh, when I qualified as a surgeon, I couldn't spell epidemiology. I was a sure surgeon. I was sure of what I did. And after I took up epidemiology, I'm not sure of anything. That's what epidemiology does for to you. I would, I would go back to answering your question. I know cardiac surgery is important. I know cleft is important. I know there's everything which is important, but the point is that we have to start with the burden of disease and we have to get into the daily measures. We have to have these metrics which compares cardiac surgery, the cost effectiveness of cardiac surgery with the cost effectiveness of cataract surgery. And that's the only way LMICs are ever going to be able to take a decision about human lives because it's just too complex. Everything is important. And the more emotive it is, uh, everybody's uh, purse strings start to loosen. And suddenly India has sponsored a dialysis program when we haven't solved the problem of diarrhea, we've got the national program on dialysis. I'm like, what is that our biggest problem? But that's how it is. It's, it's all driven by emotion. And ad we love to say research, advocacy, policy, a lovely axis. I know sitting at the policy table, it's emotion which drives policy. And that is why, that is why you can see the surgical diseases which are more catered and the certain surgical diseases which are less catered to. And that's because we've managed to mix up that. So we would have to step back and look at the burden of disease and have a more sensible approach. There are very few surgical burden of disease studies going on and that needs to be sponsored first before we are going to be able to come up with better solutions for it. And you're rightly said, surgical programs take a lot longer to build. It's, it's, it just takes 10 years to build that program. So we'll have to plan uh, into that. But there is, there is a lot of competing, uh, competing um, uh, uh, interests. Many people are trying to, when you sit at the Ministry of Health, everybody's trying to push their interests and you have to have a more sensible way to, coming out of this mess. And I think that's what the academics can do. Emmanuel, should I continue and finish up uh, with, uh, uh, with the last bit? Uh, uh, just, um, I'll come back to you uh, if we All still right. have time. I, I want uh, Guan to, um, he has um, an additional, some additional comments. Guan, over to you. Thank you, Emmanuel. Yes, just a quick, um, uh, thing to to address regarding the uh, global surgical uh, training because um, I have never seen uh, a training from a low-income country uh, doing his first cleft lip uh, surgery in a high-income country but I've seen a lot of uh, surgeons in training from high-income countries doing their first uh, uh, cleft lip surgery in a low-income country uh, with um, a group of medical or surgical missions. What I'm trying to say is uh, we need to be very honest and, and ethic when it comes to training for um, surgeons doing in my particular field as a plastic surgeon, craniofacial surgeon, when it comes to um, fix a cleft on a kid, um, one thing is to be trained as a craniofacial surgeon and a different thing is to just go to a low-income country and do uh, cases in indigenous people that will now have the right to ask for uh, a particular surgeon or to ask about their particular result or, 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 or follow-up. So uh, just trying to make the point that <clears throat> uh, training when it comes to uh, reconstructive surgery should always be uh, obviously supervised. And this sounds pretty obvious, but it doesn't necessarily happen this way. Uh, it should be always very uh, close and, 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 and uh, strictly supervised by uh, local uh, trained and, and experienced surgeons uh, for people coming from abroad to uh, do cases in a particular region of the world. Uh, thank you very much, Guan. I, I think that um, 
a very important aspect to the beginning uh, action, uh, beginning to address the issues is the fact that we are now able to talk about this and discuss this openly. I know that these are issues that previously we all dis discuss off, um, off, off the public space. So I think this talking about these issues really is an important first step, but, but we do need, as a number of the panelists uh, pointed out, we do need to really better un understand what all the issues are for us to properly uh, address them. Uh, I think we shouldn't be in a haste to come up with, um, with solutions. And in, and in the in a bid to better understand all the issues, I want Tina to share with us uh, some of the efforts that some of the organizations and individuals are trying to make to make sure that we understand the issues better so that we can properly address them. Tina? Okay, thank you very much, Emmanuel. So um, just like Emmanuel said, um, the issue we have before us is, is, um, is multifaceted. And it's not one that we want to pretend that with this one and a half hour call or town hall meeting, we can generate all the solutions and then um, tackle all the problems that are on ground. And because we don't simply want to talk, we want to find solutions and then also see through it that some of these solutions are implemented. Um, some of the organizations here have, and um, the individuals have decided to carry out um, a survey, which will answer the question on the burden and impact of neocolonization in global surgery. Um, the objective will be to ascertain the prevalence of neocolonization as perceived by low and middle income countries and high income country persons. So that will give us a very global perspective on what um, the thoughts are about this very um, important issue and um, how people perceive it currently. And um, we we'll also want to look at the different ways it manifests itself. If there's anything we have realized today that it comes in different ways in training, in research, in missions, just like one just talked about. And that was an, in, in um, another very key aspect that he raised there. So um, we help us ascertain that. And then at the end of the day, we'll be able to identify potential barriers and solutions to implementations of solutions that we have identified that would work. Okay. And um, I think that in summary gives us an idea of what we'd like to do going forward. It's gonna be in the form of a survey. And um, if you've been on this call, you're likely going to get um, the survey sent to you. Please kindly attend to it and um, help us to forward it to other people so that this issue that is very pressing in our hearts and in our minds will be tackled. Even if with little steps, eventually we'll get to where we all hope to be at the end of the day. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Tina. And um, uh, as we come towards the end of um, uh, this town hall, um, we, there will be follow-up emails that we put together all some of the things we have discussed, including some of the possible solutions. Uh, and it will come to everyone that has been on this call and we expect that you can make, you can still make your inputs, uh, even if those uh, did not come up uh, during uh, all the discussion. So, so I think for all the participants, please do kindly respond to whatever emails uh, comes to you. And um, I want to thank all the, the speakers for very excellent um, a discussion and for the participants for making it possible for us to have all these discussions and some of your inputs. And I think a very big thank you to all the organizations that and individuals that made this um, town hall to happen. I think it's a very big step, a very big step first step that we are beginning to discuss these issues in the open. And I'm sure as we go forward, we will all begin to feel more comfortable. It's a very difficult discussion, but I think we'll all now begin to feel more comfortable uh, to discuss uh, the issues. So thank you so much, everyone. And please stay safe and do have a good day and a good evening and a good night. Thank you. Thank you, Mario.